right, welcome to Pechacucha. Pachachka. Machu Picchu. Pocahontas. Uh, uh, Bukaki. Oh, that was Jenna. Oh, I did that. Oh, peekaboo. Okay, what is Pachachka? Pechacucha. It doesn't matter how you say it. It's Pachachka, Pechacucha. The Japanese kind of say it fast. They say Pachachka. It's all mystery. Pachachka. And what it essentially means is the sound of chit chat. It's when somebody's over there talking and you are sitting over here, you just hear a bunch of pachachka over there. What it really comes down to is these couple of architects were sitting in their office getting nonstop people bulleting them with tons and tons and tons of, uh, hey, you wanna buy this, you wanna blah, 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 whatever, and five minutes of your time and 20 minutes later they were still listening. So they said, you know what? You get 20 slides in 20 seconds a piece. It evolved into an automatic process where the people had no control over their 20 slides, and suddenly it's gone worldwide. There's 950 cities in the, United, uh, excuse me, in the world doing this. We started in 2011 as number 426. My brother kind of brought it to, yeah, 426. <laughs> that's, that's like a D plus average. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so we've been doing this a little while. This is our 16th event. Um, I can't see many hands, but let me hear a hoot of anybody who's not been to one of these. Yikes, how many have been? Okay, that works. All right, so there's a lot of people who put these together. It's kind of hard to say all their names at once, so I'm gonna make you look at that word scramble. Because uh, if, if, if you can't see the name, it doesn't mean it's not there. All of these people have helped us put this thing on, and I appreciate all of the people from running the computer, taking pictures, our DJ snacks, all of these guys, the wealthy theater. But for months and months and months, it's really been my wife, Michelle, supporting uh, my insanity with this. People back there know, yeah. Uh, Tom Scheidel has always been uh, right by our side with this. Ow! Can I hear the laugh fest? And wealthy theater. So tonight, is there anybody out there who doesn't know one of these speakers that's up here that just came? Well, that's weird. Okay. <laughs> we have an eclectic group of speakers. It is my personal goal in Grand Rapids that we pull different people together to mix up um, networks a little bit. So people are kind of thrown out of their comfort zone a little bit. And that means that tonight, this is not all laughter, although some of it should be. Um, there's some real stories. This is about people presenting their passions. It's to try and educate and motivate, uh, inspire, or uh, push people. Jeez, what am I trying to say? Share their passions, essentially. So tonight, everybody loves how beautiful Fred Stell is, don't they? <laughs> Man, hard to believe I'm gonna say that he is a 40-year 40, 40 veteran of TV, radio, independent film, Oh, industrial videos. I think that means like Nine Inch Nails. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, web series, audiobooks, in all sorts of things. Now, he might not want the public to know that part of the real reason he's here is because he's in this uh, legally committed, binding relationship with uh, one of our speakers tonight, Teresa Tomei. <laughs> and he has the pleasure of introducing her tonight. And since she's been traveling around, this is a good time for him to do it. So, without, f oh, uh, before I say this, what you've just witnessed is a mini Pachachka. Those slides have been changing every 20 seconds, and I am trying to keep with the flow. It means if you know me, I have a lot more words to say, but I didn't have the time. So this is kind of the vibe you'll get tonight. It moves that fast. If you don't like a speaker, give them the respect, give them the, the applause, everything else. Just realize they'll be done in six minutes and 40 seconds. So I'd love to bring Fred Stella out. Thank you, Dan. Good evening, Grand Rapids. You know, Dan actually uh, approached me, along with other people, said, hey, do you want to be involved in Pechacucha? And I, I actually, I thought it had something to do with free food. And so I said, yes, uh, no, not knowing anything about what it is that one does when one does Pechacucha. So I, I said, sure, and then I didn't hear from him, and it turns out that uh, somebody else in my household was chosen uh, to do that. <laughs> and I wasn't, which was fine, because I got enough to do in my life anyway, but then they called me, they say, would you do, would you MC? 
okay, well, I have lived now for the last few days with someone rehearsing to do Pecha Kucha, <laughs> and I am so glad that I'm emceeing. <laughs> oh my God, wait till you see this. These people, all of them, must have worked very, very hard. So, theoretically, I am ready to go all if right. you are. Thank you, Fred. You're welcome. Everybody, Fred Stella. Gracias. Everybody, give me a big. Okay, uh, so I have the great pleasure of introducing some incredibly talented people. We're going to start with uh, Sarah Jean Anderson. You've heard of her. I assume so because she was ranked by Review Magazine's Reader's Poll as um, the best local comedian in 2016. She is, among other things, an experimental comic, a character actor who's been performing original burlesque, improv, stand-up comedy <laughs> since 2005. She's an artist, a musician, and she volunteers with the nonprofit organizations Girls Rock and the Creative Youth Center. And she is always happy to see you. You can find Sarah Jean hosting the monthly art and performance events at Dr. Sketchy's Anti-Art School GR and Shimmy Shack Burlesque in Grand Rapids. She's been doing that since 2009. And she's what's up to, and check out her latest artwork at SarahJeanAnderson.com. Here she is, SarahJeanAnderson.com. I think I came out too early. Sorry about that, Fred. Before I get started, I just wanted to say that Fred Stella is um, the man behind Grand Rapids Singing Telegram. And just really quick, this is a huge deal for me to be with Fred Stella tonight, because I've always known that song. Call us today, Grand Rapids Singing Telegram. <laughs> Love you, Fred Stella. Love you. So thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. I'm ready to get started. Brian, you're a babe. All right. They said to say something to Brian. So I'm a comic, um, I'm, uh, I'm a character actress, and I like to do all these different characters. These are some of my, um, all 12 of my fans love these characters. And a lot of them are just like constipation faces with wigs. Um, I have a lot of theories about why I like to perform as different characters, and I think they're all kind of disturbing. Um, so I like to stick with the idea that just characters have really had a big impact on my life. Um, I'm wearing my Leslie Note button right here, my favorite character. There's another character. These guys would become very important to me later on in life, but um, when I was a little kid, I couldn't sleep at night, and my mom got me this little TV, and I used to fall asleep to old episodes of SNL. So I fell asleep to the sound of characters, and one of my first nightmares ever was about me and John Belushi in the back of a limo eating mac and cheese. <laughs> and he spills the mac and cheese. Later on in high school, I would have a really terrific sexual experience with a woman. Um, nobody went woo woo! <laughs> While Gilda Radner played in the background. We were watching Rosanna, Rosanna, Dana, and just something about that shrill voice, it still just makes my nipples hard. I'm, so I'm a Gemini. This is the ancient symbol for Gemini, I'm sure you all know. Another, some other characters that had a big impact on me as a child. Uh, but it means I have sort of a personality split. I'm kind of, I'm kind of a, a, a bunch of different kinds of people all in one, all living inside me, rent free. <laughs> I think that characters are my ultimate uh, sort of way of having revenge against people who have wronged me. Because we all want the people who have like hurt us to feel like dicks, don't we? That's what we want, and that's what I strive to do in my characters. Um, one time I opened the door for a woman at Jimmy John's and she said, do you think I care? And so, boom, she's a character who hates courtesy. <laughs> this is Cody Masters, and Cody is all the ex-boyfriends who've ever dumped me, because uh, fucking they had to work on their band, and their band's called Veins of Dust, and they banged your mom. <laughs> Mabel is an old woman I used to work with who one day told me my ass was growing bigger. 
And I was like, I think your mouth's getting bigger, bitch. I think she died. But anyway, that's Mabel Patty Patterson. It's just the, the sort of voice that I give to women who go to my craft shows and really like my art. That's darling. Oh, that's, you're a funky girl. You're a funky girl. You made that? You're funky. You're just kind of funky. That's what she sounds like. They're all from Ada. But Rita Shevin and it's... They seriously, they're all from Ada. They seriously are. But Rita Shevin and it's is my oldest and my most favorite character. And I know what a favorite daughter is because I am not the favorite daughter. And this is my favorite daughter. It's Rita. And Rita's voice kind of sounds like this. These are some other portraits of Rita. Just again, constipation faces with wigs is what I do. It's, it's how I put food on the table for me and my dog. Um, but this is Rita, and Rita has an interesting story that goes along with her about how she was born, how she sprang forth from my loins, my juicy loins. When I was in high school, I had a red jacket. And um, this is, I just Googled chubby white girl red jacket, and this is what came up. It's really weird. But I had a red jacket that had my name embroidered on it. It said Rita, and that's a nickname I had in high school. So I used to wear this old red jacket, just like this one with the name Rita embroidered on it. Um, Rita was born in a beautiful place, in a beautiful palace in the sky called Circuit City. Rest in peace, if y'all remember Circuit City. Um, just look at how beautiful it is. <laughs> my parents let me and my friends, uh, my parents let me skip school for a day and wait in line to meet the boy band 98 Degrees because, because my education was really important to my parents. They knew I was going to be somebody. So they're like, yes, by all means, stand in line with no adults. Um, my favorite was Drew. He, he was Nick Lachey's brother. I like the underdog. He was like not talented. He was just the cute one. And if I could fulfill an 18-year-old fantasy of mine, I'm going to sing some of their music right now. You're my sunshine after the rain. You're the cure against my fear and my pain. And I'm losing my mind when you're not around. It's all, it's all, it's all because of you. This is what the women in line to meet them looked like. All the women in line. I was a 15-year-old girl, and I was the minority at this thing. And this thing was these 500-pound women with 500 children running around them. And they all had um, sort of lawn chairs and coolers, like it was their homeschool outing for the week. And that was really interesting to me. The kids behind me, they're a bunch of little snot-nosed brats. They started to play a game of volleyball in line. And while they were playing this game of volleyball with their mom watching on, one of the girls threw the volleyball and it hit me in the head, just like this. That's what it looked like. That's actually me in high school, right there. <laughs> I was a looker. <laughs> and it hit me in the head, and one of those Job of the Hut women laughed. I heard her. <laughs> And it was the only thing all day that she didn't yell at her goddamn kids about. <laughs> you can go online and you can see the first ever Rita video. So Rita is an impersonation of these women in line to meet 98 degrees with me, particularly the one whose children threw a volleyball at my head. You can see the first ever Rita video right here. You go to my, uh, go to my YouTube and it's called The Birth of Rita. There's three different videos. And I guess if there's anything that you can learn from this, it's just, if you're ever in line with me somewhere, just watch your balls. Just watch your balls. We could have the displeasure of living on forever and not in a good way. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> Okay, right now we're going to bring up a gentleman who is an artist. He's the publisher of Rapid Growth. He is a son of Flint, Michigan. He will sit you down and wax nostalgic about drinking clean water in Flint. <laughs> and he's an all around funny guy and raconteur, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tommy Allen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there. All right. 
these hard things with guys you have to get right at my age. Okay, here we go. No pills yet, yet. <laughs> Uh, before we start, I'm just going to say it's really weird following Sarah because typically I open for Sarah and then of course I said, Sarah, you realize I'm talking about my dad's death tonight, so this is really going to be awkward for a few minutes, but uh, trust me, uh, with every bad thing that happens to you, there are some funny moments that happen as well. And, I, and uh, welcome to uh, pet your dog if you have one, so <laughs> let's roll, first slide. Okay, so I was in the garden when I uh, got the, the note that my, my dad was being rushed to the hospital. I didn't know what it was going to be because my family often is being rushed to the hospital for one thing or another. So I didn't know what to think of it, but this seemed pretty important. So uh, I left there, and, and this was actually the last image I would take in Grand Rapids before I'd arrive in, in Flint, where the next image I would take is me saying goodbye to my father. He wouldn't die this day, which is really weird because they brought the crash card in. I'd watched him try to like get his breath, and we were told we went to bed that night, like, your dad's not gonna make it and so I slept on the floor and you know like we do in those awful hospital places and uh, I get a text that wakes me up in the morning and here's my dad the next morning <laughs> that fucker beat death I love him but he was supposed to go the night before there he is. Uh, and, and so, but, but this was his last day. And so we had a great last day. He's shooting straws at nurses. He's flirting with people, especially the nurses with big boobs that were like, you know, there. But, but he did die that day, and it was really sad. And, and so it was great because my family are very religious. My family, they're singing, and I'm crying for the first time. And all of a sudden, my mom says, well, at least he won't be alone in heaven because those two babies that we had are up there. I'm going, what babies? I'm the oldest. <laughs> And then I find out that other ones are having babies that are up there. And, and I thought, well, this is really kind of absurd and strange because, you know, I, I, I give heaven a lot of room to be real, but this idea that I have an older sibling and one right after me kind of freaks me out. It's like, I like being the oldest. But so that happens, and, and I realize it's a little absurd and everything, but, but none of us, we all knew he wouldn't rally, and so we knew that was it. Um, but then afterwards, I, I would be going through photographs like everybody does. You've all had to build those boards, maybe for someone you love. And this picture came across. It has a speed graphic camera, which my dad and I connected around because it was a camera that he found very, very important to him when he was in World War II. He left West Virginia because, you know, quite frankly, he's a hillbilly with an eighth grade education. It's weird laws down there, by the way. He couldn't advance. Um, he went into the, to the war, but he picked up this skill of using a camera, which after the war, he would then come back to his hometown and open a portrait studio. He would then go on to become a press photographer. And, you know, if anybody that works in media can tell you, there's not a lot of money in it. So it was from there up to Flint, Michigan. And this is pre-water crisis, by the way. They had good water back then. And he moved on to Flint where at Flint he went to work for General Motors. And what I really like about him being in General Motors is that he took that opportunity to really kind of better himself. He kind of learned a lot. And um, while, he was, while he was there, he, he became quite good at this and he made a career of it and I was quite proud of him. But he was always you know, a good dad through it all. Um, now, I have to admit, <laughs> raising me is not an easy thing. A an artist child, my mom put up with this, as you can see, for the most part. Um, just take the damn picture, people are looking, Tommy. My dad clearly enjoyed it. In fact, he enjoyed my antics so much, I like to think that I inspired him as much as he inspired me, so that when he would go abroad, he would send me pictures like this. Just, and he wasn't much of a reader, so. So I knew the joke was also that, you know, dad, eighth grade education, you weren't the best reader, but there it is. In fact, I, I really liked the fact that he would send me these pictures because they showed that he had a sense of humor and I enjoyed that. One of the last trips we took together, and I'll admit, if you're older and you take a trip with your parents, it's fucking a nightmare, to be honest. I mean, they gotta stop in the bathroom every 10 minutes. But when we were at the World War II Memorial, it was so moving, it was the happiest day of my life because so many people came up to him who had lost people and he had survived somehow all these years to be you know, his age. Uh, He's a Republican. I'm just going to admit it. I'm going to come up for my father. He was a Republican. Uh, and it's okay. He's old school Republican. We used to laugh about this all the time. In fact, he used to always sign off and we'd have these conversations. You know, you're my lovable liberal. And I always wanted to say, 
I just want to reply, well, Dad, I'm that saucy homosexual the straights like, so you'll learn to like me too. But he would come to Grand Rapids and he loved it. He'd go to the oysters at the downtown market because I wouldn't let him eat him out of the can at his age because I was just afraid what the fuck was in those cans. And, and so he would have these questions of me. And, and so we'd have these other conversations. And in case that last one, he just said, I hope they're wearing underwear on that swing, if you remember that. Um, <laughs> But he always went into my garden and liked to pick at the flowers, like pick them up and find stories. And I think it was like numerology for dummies he might have read because he always tried to come up with a reason for how many petals and what they meant. He, you know, he had that great way of connecting with people no matter where he went. And this is a picture actually my sister took of me. Probably a hard one for me to even look at today because everybody was around the, around the dead body texting, which was so fucking absurd for me. And all I could think about was like, he's gone. And in a few minutes, they're gonna come and pick up this body and that'll be the last I see him in this state before the makeup. And so when they asked me to do this, they said, what was funny about learning about death? I'm like, what the fuck is funny about death? And then it hit me. In this picture is his parents. And I realized that my father lost his parents too and somehow found the grace to laugh and enjoy life and to love my mother and to start a family. And as you can see, he was always up for something. This is from the 80s. I just got back from New York City, bought a bunch of thrift clothes. And he says, hey, let me try those clothes on. And we did an impromptu photo shoot in our living room at our home. So that was really, that was special for me that, you know, that laughter is what we, we carry with us, that we go forward. Um, this is our last family portrait, okay? <laughs> And, and it encapsulates the whole Brown family. It's like John Waters took the picture, I'm just gonna say it. And what I love about this picture is like, there's even space if we need it, we can put fetuses in there later on, they're up in heaven. So, when I came back to Grand Rapids, the last picture, and I know this from looking through my photographs, the, the, the first picture I took when I came back was back in my garden again. And it just reminded me that, you know, there's this coincidence of nature and flowers and life with my father. And the best I can hope for if his, that spirit is challenging me, that hopefully he's still with me, just not watching that closely because that's gonna really ruin masturbation time for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tommy Allen. Excellent, excellent. Okay, moving right along, because we do move along in this. Uh, Aaron Betka is uh, coming up next. Aaron is the president of Funny Girls, and uh, that is a Grand Rapids-based comedy group. She is a local actor, comedian, and producer. Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Betka. <laughs> I am super honored to be up here talking on behalf of Funny Girls. Um, and thank you, Pecha Kucha, for having us. You're welcome. Wherever, wherever you are, there you are. <laughs> That's Pecha Kucha, ladies and gentlemen, right there. Um, all right, we're ready. <clears throat> Women are funny. <laughs> Contrary to, to d traditional belief, Women are funny, uh, and I'm gonna digress right now. So we, I'm representing we, are funny girls. We are a collective of self-identifying female comedic artists. Um, we, are, uh, we developed in 2015 when we saw a lack of female comedy uh, presentation in Grand Rapids. So uh, we wanted to create a group that uh, created resources and an environment for women. So instead of competing in the comedy world alone, we decided to take it on together. We joined forces, and what began as a defiant move quickly and naturally turned into a network of talent and community and support. Our first shows, we wrote love letters to, uh, or we, we, we read love letters, and we read our journals, and we had a really good time with it. And by the second show, and third show, and fourth show, we created sketches. And it turned out, yes, we are pretty damn funny as our audience uh, says there. <laughs> Since our inception, we've continuously supported each other in our own growth in comedy and as a collective. Uh, but when we look at the things that, that women have been told in our lives to keep to yourself, to don't make mistakes, to get permission, don't think critically, don't have opinion, 
you see that these line up with all of the things that you should be in comedy, right? There we go. Uh, so so the, the history of comedy has been, obviously, tragedy plus timing equals comedy. Um, but I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a second. I believe that uh, it's not an equation, it's not science, it's an actual uh, art form, if you will. And as an art form, comedy is subjective. There are not just a handful of senses of humor in this world. There are seven billion senses of humor, right? So each person comes with their own sense of humor. And what they find funny or not funny is based on their upbringing, their background, their values, their hopes. So when you approach jokes like homophobic jokes or, or sexist jokes or racist jokes, you better have some kind of uh, uh, empathy and sincerity to them, okay? So if comedy is primarily uh, subjective, what is objectively funny? These things, shared experiences, the unexpected, physicality, wordplay, wit, and parallel reality. I know it's not just five, we don't have a lot of time, I had to put five up there, okay? <laughs> when we line up what women are supposed to be to line up what actually is funny, we see some really interesting parallels here, right? So we see that everything that a woman shouldn't be is everything that a comedian should be. I'm gonna let you kind of think on that. <laughs> so when you keep to yourself, we can't share our experiences, right? Centuries of women have been told to keep to yourself and it's denied them from any kind of current events, some worldly knowledge, any kind of belonging of society. So when uh, just recently we, we are able to experience that, <laughs> oh. I know, there are a lot, it's a lot. These are real, these are real. Uh, when audiences hear a female voice, they hear a female experience, they don't hear a, a, an actual experience. Women are supposed to be perfect, you're not supposed to make mistakes. How do, you, how do you learn the unexpected? You make mistakes. But if we haven't had that ability to make mistakes, we will never be able to learn how to make the unexpected happen, right? We need permission all the time, right? So how are young girls who have always been asked to get permission, how are young girls, are, how are they able to um, explore their environment or play or clown around without the risk of threat or, or the threat of risk? Women can't think critically. Wordplay and wit and double entendres take a lot of knowledge, they take a lot of experience. And, and if, if, if we have been den denied that kind of thing, <laughs> I know, they're real. They're real, take it in. <laughs> We've been denied education since the like, late 1960s, honestly. We've been owned by a man since the 1960s. Uh, we won't have an opinion. We won't be able to have an opinion until uh, that gets addressed. <laughs> Uh, so, they're not to say that women can't do it or won't do it. In fact, since 1985, women have uh, obtained more college degrees than men. We want to know things. We want to be funny. We want to be present, right? We just haven't always had a part to be in it. We want to play it, but we can't be a part of it. This is not a woe is me story. I'm not trying to make you feel bad for us. I'm trying to say, funny girls are doing something about it. Uh, this is the story of funny girls. We are a group that accidentally started to find empowerment in each other, and now we're trying to spread that to men and women alike. Funny Girls smashes the tradition of, of expectation and, and of women while creating a safe and creative environment. Uh, we have weekly meetings where we share experiences. We create the unexpected during our rehearsals. We think critically in our sketches and when we do improv, we use our bodies and we own them while we perform on stage and we certainly hold strong opinions. The benefits of comedy are vast. It includes better public speaking, uh, 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 self-awareness, um, and heightened thinking. By hosting monthly workshops, uh, we are able to spread that to women. And now, through our outreach program, we are working to spread that to future funny girls. The same girls that are writing in those journals and writing those embarrassing love letters that we perform off of. Because it is never too early, and it's never too late and it's never too masculine or feminine to teach imagination and to encourage empathy. Funny Girls 
has always encouraged empathy within each other. It's, it's, what it, it's led us to different worlds. And though we may not be able to share in somebody's pain completely, or somebody's sorrow, or their oppression, or their struggle, we can share laughter. And we can use that as a weapon to continue the hurt, or we can use it as a tool to create empathy and understanding. Thank you. Erin Beckham, Funny Girl. Our next gentleman is named Juan Daniel Castro, and he was born in Querétaro, a state located in the central highlands of Mexico. He moved to Grand Rapids in 1996 while chasing a unicorn he has not yet trapped. <laughs> he is a self-described melody craftsman whose interests span from emotion to language to shared meaning. Living, singing, living, dying, or as he likes to say, Vivir, cantar, vivir, morir. Juan Daniel Castro. Thank you, thank you much. On behalf of the board of the Grand Rapids Community Media Center, I'd like to welcome you to your house. We build community through media. Shout out to Linda Godesh, Aaron Wilson, and Tom Schwally up front. Give it up for them. Not too long ago, I was sitting down at Grand Rapids Brewing Company when I realized, shit, I have to go and present to Pecha Kucha. And uh, well, I figured that the path to follow was drink a beer, find that topic, write an outline. Simple as that. First beer, no topic. Second beer, no topic. Third beer, I kept saying Juan, Juan, one more, <laughs> and the guy got really pissed at me, and so he didn't pour me no more beer. We all have a personal epistemology that begins with the day we are born, yet not all of us realize this. For me, it took many, many years when I became a naturalized citizen of the US of A. Uh, that day, I went to the officer, passed my exam. He asked, what do you want to be called? And I said, Juan Daniel Castro. He looked at me funny, and I said, make sure that the first field reads Juan Daniel, the second reads Castro. End of story. <laughs> My notion of nation was somewhat defined, but as an Americano, I always dreamt of going to other continents, Europe, Asia, Africa. Most of us immigrants talk about the bounty we find in our new countries, new friends, new family, new home, new car, new everything. Seldomly, do we speak about the many things we leave behind? I fondly remember, for instance, my notebooks, uh, my posters uh, as a teenage boy, the Golden Gate, the, t the Twin Towers, the, the Eiffel Tower. I had a ton of posters, one of Chick Corea too, and one of a, a Stanway uh, piano. Like knowledge, iron breaches are the epitome of man-made creation. Knowledge breaches truth and belief. It makes us human. Understanding how I know that I know what I know and what I don't know affords me the possibility to get to know you better. Like knowledge, music is humanizing. Although for me, music uh, is more non-symbolic thought. I was born with congenital dystagmus and strabismus, so I can't really read or write music as I would the alphabet. Oh, <laughs> there's Julio. Um, why was I telling you this? Well, I, I don't know, I guess uh, for me, uh, for me, thinking uh, comes naturally and, and, and it's symbolic. When I first came to the US, I didn't know squat about cultural identity or identity politics. Soon after, I learned that I had more in common with Puerto Ricans than with the average American. So I started singing and dancing salsa. I embraced their culture and became Mexican. <laughs> by de facto or by immersion. Before that, I didn't even feel like an outsider. One day, a gorgeous looking woman I was trying to flirt with, rightfully so, pointed out that I had an accent. <laughs> nah, -uh. you owe me, buddy. You do not 
own me. She vehemently refuted as I was testing my newly learned American idiom to explain that I was thankful and indebted to her. Seeing, making friends, falling in love, learning how to be Hispanic. I remember the first time I was told that I was Hispanic, it was um, one of the gang members that I briefly associated with. He said, Ese, you're Hispanic. And I said, heck no, I'm not Hispanic. He said, yeah, there's Mexicans and then there's Puerto Ricans. And we are at war. I, he just took a shoot by um, in that neighborhood and I was in panic. I, ran out of that neighborhood and went, lived somewhere else. For me, family is very important, that's my brother. He used to brag about me being his brother, now tables turned, he's a gem. If you ever tried his uh, cuisine, I'm pretty sure you will verify that. My accent has, uh, uh, has gotten a little, a little better, I think, a li I think. <laughs> I earned the right to say that it has gotten a little better. I even learned to code switch and cover up to fool my interlocutor with my ethnic background. <laughs> this damn obsession of yours, god damn it, with otherizing, are you Polish, are you Irish, are you Mexican, are you German, anyway. Um, I choose my friends, uh, sometimes they choose me, and you know, that has, to be at their own risk because they don't know what they're getting into. <laughs> uh, one of the wise things I, I did was uh, to, to remain in this community and be a part of it and, and see firsthand the, the flourishing of it. And uh, actors, as well as the stage, has changed for the good, I argue. So every now and then, I don't make music. Mostly it's in my head. I'm now a spectator. Um, who loves the jazz, uh, local jazz scene, and, and who loves the lush life, of course. In days like this, I asked to myself, why in the world are you still here? Go back to Querétaro. Then, you know, all, all I know is nice out, the Uber surcharge drops, and so I can move around the city <laughs> easily and cheaper, and so everything else is forgotten. I won't forget these guys because these are my nieces and nephews. And soon enough, they will come to the realization that they too have a personal epistemology. I hope, I really hope that it doesn't take them 34 years and a wall and a border. Now, um, it, it took me many Erotomania episodes, each one of them a song of its own waiting to be written. It took me coming to this country and 34 years, as I said. This man has just taught us a lesson. There's no wall that is too tall to climb and conquer. Even mental ones can be conquered. All I have to say is we live in one nation, and that's Mother Earth. We are one race, and that's humankind. And we ought to speak one language, and that ought to be empathy. We are citizens of the world. Juan Gabriel Castro. I'm very excited to bring out our next guest. He's a longtime friend, Tim Cusack has entertained, touched tens of thousands of people the past 25 years. A lot of people describe him as a combination of Garrison Keillor, Robin Williams, and the Dalai Lama, <laughs> which sounds odd, but really, although the Dalai Lama is known for nonviolent resistance and serenity, his comedic timing is perfect. Tim is a rare speaker who can open himself up with incredible candor and make each event very special. He developed his versatility and unique approach as one of 10 children raised on a beef farm in Michigan, which makes perfect sense. If you're gonna have 10 children, a beef farm is a good place to be. <laughs> and with an undetected learning disability, Tim barely made it through school, and while figuring out who he was and what he wanted to do, he traveled the country, he worked as a ranch hand, ski resort dishwasher, prep cook, house painter, Christmas tree trimmer, Back in Grand Rapids, he's done many things, including being a part of a wonderful improv uh, troupe, last minute improv, 
and the co-creator of the, one of the funniest sketches I've ever seen, Bus Farts. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tim Cusack. <laughs> Good. Ended on bus farts. That's... All right. So, um, you know when you look at a photo uh, of yourself from the past? No, not yet, but uh, there it is. All right. <laughs> that was uh, about two, three months ago, and that is, so I'm starting now and going back, but that's kind of what I do now. So that was at the uh, Mary Freebed Gala, and I have a microphone, and I'm talking to a uh, thousand people, and, and I do that sort of thing once in a while, as well as doing corporate training and, and that. So that is one part of my life. And what I was going to say before you threw that one up was we, we have many lives within one lifetime. That's a, a Buddhist saying. So when you look at a photo from the past, you think, oh, that seems like a lifetime ago. It's because it was. There are many lives within one lifetime. So, okay, so uh, now that is one of the houses that I own, and that's another part of my life. I've been buying real estate since I was uh, in my, I guess, uh, mid-20s. Um, and that's a house, if you recognize that, it's in Heritage Hill. That's one of my favorite uh, houses. Um, so anyway, and that, uh, that seems like a lifetime ago, and that was 2012, I wrote that book. And it was truly, uh, I, I'd never done anything like that. And you know, they, they say it's really painful to write a book, and it was really painful. And thank God I had a phenomenal editor because she really bore the, the weight of that book. Um, and then I do this stuff. Uh, I bless people. So that's a, one of my characters that I do, that's Father Tim. And he would show up at events. He was born at WLAV, the morning show. And I still dress up as Father Tim, but not as much anymore, but it's fun going out as a priest. And um, that was the first Laugh Fest. <laughs> not many people know, but uh, I was behind some closed doors with the director of Gilda's Club, that first Laugh Fest, uh, uh, and went through some really serious stuff because we didn't know if it was gonna work. Honest to God, we did not know Laugh Fest was gonna work. Uh, but obviously, ta-da! It did. And this is another uh, part of my life. So I'm a volunteer, and one of them is hospice. So uh, when people are dying, I help them do that with dignity and grace. Um, and also uh, uh, with uh, Gilda's Club, I volunteer uh, grief night with the kids. Um, so I'm drawn to that issue. Um, this is also, uh, for five summers, I was a teacher at a camp for learning disability kids. Because as you heard in the intro, I was one. Um, and I knew what the deal was with those kids because I was one and I, so I taught at this camp. Now that looks weird, doesn't it? Uh, Tim, I didn't know. Yeah, uh, that guy, I worked in the recovery world for a while. And that guy is really quite famous, uh, but you never knew it was Gary who, that guy published uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul. Yeah, all those books, and that guy was in some serious trouble, and he happened to, we, we um, were at an event that I helped his life, apparently. So we became friends ever after. Um, and this is what I used to do, this I did for 15 years, traveled around the country, and I did children's theater. All over, from New York to LA, and I did uh, story theater, and this was a show I did um, that was called The Environmental Show. This I also did from um, early 20s, all for numbers of years when I wasn't performing, I was a house painter. And I did stuff like that, like that too, you know, you just reach and do stupid stuff or you could kill yourself. I did that, so <laughs> exactly like that, which you should never do, but I did it anyway. That guy in the center, that guy's named Bob Moyer, he was the one that kind of saved my life because he, that, the t-shirts that say United Stage, the first class I ever took in theater was at Grand Valley and he taught that class. And that class, that was the original class back in the early 80s. And they're all old and they're gonna die soon. So. <laughs> um, I, did, I did that. I did the deadliest catch. That's the boat that I was on, that was the Alaskan Enterprise. That kid, that's not funny. All right, because uh, you almost died. But I did that. That was a, the crew. That was what the, the, the that's a, a crab pot. That's what the sea, with Bering Sea. That was me. Cut my hair for the show. And uh, 
But I worked as a landscape guy one summer at Grand Valley. Um, before actually that ch children's theater class happened, that was me at Grand Valley with a hard hat and long bleached hair. Uh, whoa, hey now. Uh, this is senior in high school. And we took that van, check out the carpet on the door, people. Huh? Huh? I think some dope was smoked in that van. And that was a high school crew. The guy on the end with the glasses, curly hair, he took a nap and he never woke up. And that happens with your old classmates. And you never think it will, but it does. I did that one summer. I was a carny. I, oh, I worked at the Ionia Free Fair. I did the kitty ride, I did the ring toss. You know how, I can tell you right now. Quarter to play, quarter to win, come on in. Boom, got the people. <laughs> I was also a dishwasher many times. Did any dishwashers in here? I used to tell people when they said, so what do you do? I'd say, I'm into uh, engineering, a lot of hydraulics, water hydraulics, stuff like that. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> and I was really, I really enjoyed dishwashing. I also did this job. You know when you buy a Christmas tree and it's nice shaped like a cone, a little leader at the top? I did that. I trimmed Christmas trees for two summers and it's a really hot, miserable job but I wanted to make money and that's how we did it. Clippers just like that and we would clip Christmas trees. And the, my training was, was, well, there I am again. So <laughs> that, now that is a good looking bale of hay right there. <laughs> and the reason I know is because I was a farm boy. That's good hay right there. And he's not bad looking either, but uh, yeah, I really, I, we baled hay and we carried bales of hay just like that. Uh, I was a camp counselor and uh, uh, camp's always fun and you meet the other counselors. Sometimes you have sex and stuff, you know. <laughs> Somebody like that. And when you do, yes, it feels good, but you also make people like this. <laughs> and those are my two little chillins and that's when uh, you look back and any parent in this room, when you look back and you see your kids and the reason it hits you when you think that seems like a lifetime ago, the re reason it's magnified is because both you were there and they were there. And that's why it becomes so powerful and so magnified because it's doubled lifetimes. Thank you. Tim Cusack. Someone else I'm very pleased to introduce because I've known her for many years. Nancy Gallardo grew up in Michigan. She lives in Grand Rapids. She is an activist, a freelance theater arts instructor, a props designer, a radio programmer at WYCE, which is how I know Nancy. She served on the boards of West Michigan Pride and Ebony Road Players, and she recently received international attention on social media while standing up for the rights of Native Americans at the Standing Rock Reservations. <laughs> Nancy describes herself as Indigenous, and about her experience at Standing Rock, she says, I truly believe it was a calling of my great-grandmothers to be there. Nancy Gallardo. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody here, and it's uh, wonderful that uh, I know so many people, uh, Fred and Teresa, Tommy, and, and I was a little nervous because uh, my story isn't that funny, so I'm backstage and I'm telling Tim, I'm, you know, it's not that funny, you know, and, and you know, I, I got this tattoo at age 16, and he goes, wow, you're such a rebel, and I'm going, oh, right, okay, and all I'm thinking is, I gotta pee, and, uh, uh, you know, water is life, Minnie McConey, yeah, yeah, so uh, this is the story of how I got uh, my first tattoo at age 60. All right, here we go. Uh, the Standing Rock Tattoo is created by Stephanie Big Eagle, a descendant of the Osheti Shikawi uh, Sioux Nation tribe and an Odapo movement participant. In the heart of th there's a Thunderbird, it's a circle which represents the nations who have come together uh, to stand for Standing Rock. And um, I got my tattoo uh, on my last day at Standing Rock at the Osheti camp by a French journalist who was a tattoo artist. 
Uh, her name is Anella Nunes. So I, uh, yeah, I actually got my tattoo. She only had, I only have these thin needles. I said, okay, uh, it was my first tattoo. I have to do it four times. So yeah, that was a, that was a, that was a pleasant experience. Um, I left Standing Rock on election day uh, on November. It was, uh, I was traveling alone, but I, I, the stops in Chicago, I met Nicole and Colin. I met Minnesota, I met Mary and Winter and in Bismarck. I met Mariah, all headed to Standing Rock. Uh, that's Mariah in the middle. Uh, that, on our first day at camp, we shared a, a, a tent together. Even though we had individu individual tents, we shared that tent together that first day. Mariah was arrested uh, along with 40 other peoples the next day. Uh, the, their, uh, the charges and the whereabouts were unknown. Uh, the Michigan host tent where we ended up all staying eventually uh, was a home away from home from those in Michigan who traveled to support the fight at Standing Rock. My new friends became Michiganders. That's Nancy Showman, our cook. I was later to be named the other Nancy. Uh, yeah, I took over the cooking duties uh, after she returned. Uh, Nancy had been on many action calls and had even been arrested and released by the Morton County Police. She told of hand, uh, first hand accounts of Dakota Access Pipeline dabble, of security sicking dogs and unarmed protesters, and of women being arrested and held in dog kennels with their hands tightly held by zip ties. And in early November, peaceful protesters crossed a makeshift bridge to Turtle Island, a sacred burial hill located northeast of camp. They were met at the banks by militarized police and dapple mercenaries who had already desecrated the sacred territorial land there. Uh, the, the Dakota Access Pipeline stretches across the north uh, and south, uh, to north and south Dakota to Illinois. Originally, it was slated to run through Bismarck, a, a predominantly white community. They protested and feared that it might contaminate their drinking water. It was rerouted to the Sioux Reservation under the Cannonball River that runs out to Missouri. Uh, that's their drinking water. Uh, a call to action echoed around the world uh, to honor the future generations, to fight for the pipeline, to protect water in all of the sacred places. In my heart felt that calling. I had to go there. On my first action call while at Standing Rock, we went to Mandan and construction site where uh, Dapple kept their digging equipment and we went to pray at the entrance and several people got injured by a construction worker who was, uh, decided to drive through, through us and he shot guns and fired in the air. Uh, my second call to action was at Bismarck to a courthouse and a jail. We wanted to find out what happened to our 40 friends who had been arrested earlier. That's Reba Loeb, a 93-year-old protester. She reminded me that activism is a lifetime commitment. Uh, my third call to action was on the bridge. There was one girl that was hit in the face by a tear gas cannon, another whose arm was uh, blown off by a percussion grenade. My tent mate Noah was hit in the head by a rubber bullet. That's me on the left. After I was hit with a tear gas canister to the chest and blasted by a water cannon, I made Rolling Stones magazine. <laughs> it was the sub-zero temperatures and I'd gotten sick from the tear gas and the water blast and I had to go back to GR. It was 2.30 uh, Thanksgiving day that I arrived. My friend Ted Jaw, this dude over here, he drove me to the hospital. I had ammonia, bronchospasms, a nose infection. Ted took that picture, by the way. Thank you, Ted. <laughs> Um, as I was in the hospital after being released, I, I spent the next four hours looking for a ride back to Standing Rock. I found a ride with the Michigan vets, and I was grateful. They had told me, and I told them they brought me to tears, and they said, wipe them, you're coming with us. That's Steve Perry, not the rock star. Steve Perry, the Michigan vet. Uh, <laughs> I spent the next weeks in the kitchen in Michigan, Ted cooking with uh, Jessica Foster and others under extreme cold conditions, feeding the water protectors, uh, security, the medics, the construction crew, anyone who was hungry was fed. Uh, Standing Rock lives. There are many folks just like those who have gone to different places in the country to set up camps to protect the, wa the water, the sacred lands, the treaty rights. One small fire has created many. <sighs> and there, we will find them. Just look online, you'll find all these camps are glorious. 
My last uh, week there was during Christmas holiday. We made gifts to share, notebook cookies, okay, spaghetti dinner, uh, cheesecake, anything that was no cook, that's what we pretty much cooked there. Uh, uh, we comforted each other and then we became a, a family. We embraced each other. Um, my last day there, there was a huge blizzard and with a piercing, loud thunder clap. You could hear the voices throughout the camp cheering. Camp cheering. It was a thunderbird, and he had spoken. I got my tattoo that day. My last call to action came after getting my tattoo. I mean, really, right after. I mean, we heard the planes buzzing, and I couldn't wait to get out of that tent because I knew something was happening. I made it to Turtle Island. I crossed the plane. I walked over the, the Cannonball River, and I made it there. That was a bloody good day. I got my first tattoo at the age of 60 at Standing Rock, North Dakota. I will forever be a water protector because activism is a lifelong commitment. Nancy Gallardo. Welcome back to part two. We are so, so glad you are still here. We did not scare anybody away. In fact, it looks like there are more people. Did all of you pay? All right, give yourselves a big hand. While you're doing that, I want you to keep it up. DJ Snacks is in the house, as we say. And one of the people that never gets enough credit because everything that we do depends upon their go button. This is, this is actually S, if he's a disc jockey, he's the slide jockey. This is Brian, give Brian a hand. It takes so many volunteers to put something like this together. And when we move into a theater, it takes even more. Um, but we're always looking for people to help us, even if it's just showing up and helping people at the door or whatever the thing is. Um, we set up our own sound system, our own slides. We're usually at places like Sanchez and Noto's. And so there's a lot more eating and drinking going on. This is a really civilized event, so please keep the noise up um, if you can. And if you know how to make clinking sounds, we're used to actually the sound of glasses and stuff clinking, so. Um, something special is coming up right now. We have something that we do that's called 20 Random Slides. And usually somebody is chosen out of the audience or somebody is invited to come up that we really hate and we put up 20 random slides and they have to tell us what it's about. But these guys are so good, they deserve a real introduction from somebody who's a real MC. Yes, really. <clears throat> so I want to bring back out a guy who I'm going to steal away from Teresa, and my wife doesn't even know about it. I like this guy so much, um, not just because of the things that are on his bio, but he does so many other good things that we don't even know about. And so he does good everywhere he goes. Um, He's my personal Buddha. Ladies and gentlemen, Fred Stella. Thank you, Ted. And welcome back to the second half of Pechacucha. We have something really, really special for you right now. We have a gentleman from Pop Scholars. His name is Andy Allen. And uh, Pop Scholars, if you have not heard, is a four-man improv comedy team based here in GR. And if you've seen them, you'll know why Grand Rapids Magazine deemed them a wave of smart, culturally relevant humor that is intelligent and funny as hell. Review called them relevant and intelligent. Their parents say, I wish you'd call more. This is, what's, this is what is special about what's going on. Uh, what, uh, what Andy is gonna do is, uh, is gonna be 20 random slides. He knows the theme, but he does not know what is gonna be up on the screen, and he is going to tell you a story. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Andy Allen. <laughs> Hi, everyone. 
I'm everyone's least favorite pop scholar, Andy. How are you? Super excited to be here. The other guys are dicks and didn't show up, so I'm alone, which is fine. Which is totally fine. We do improv comedy here in Grand Rapids. This is our home base. Uh, we have a show on March 24 in case this tanks. So um, I am going to be doing 20 random slides. I've never seen it before, but good news. I've, all, I've seen all of the made-up movies that we're about to show, so let's hit it. So the first one is Crouching Tiger Hidden Figures. This is actually a documentary. It's super interesting. It's all about uh, the tigers in their most uh, primal state of uh, trying to uh, essentially eat people and other figures. Now, what uh, t people don't know about a tiger is that they are inherently uh, loving creatures, uh, and they love all people, okay? They love all people. They love people in cars. They love people, uh, samurais even, that are trying to kill the tigers. The tiger, it wants to be the friend, but what will happen is that we find out in this documentary is that uh, the tiger always wins, okay? Don't fight with a tiger. Now, a lot of people thought, now this happens in the movie, this is about three-fourths throughout the movie, uh, that maybe we can beat tiger with science. And uh, as the documentary will show, science doesn't fix anything, okay? And uh, that's, that for, for Christian America, that was a win in this documentary. <laughs> Um, and now at the end, which has happened, this is the, the Christians and also the Mormon church teaming up and saying, screw you science, we beat everyone. And it's a really hard documentary uh, and it's based on all fiction. So uh, if you want to check it out, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Figures is a really, really solid movie. Now the next one, Clockwork Orange is the new black. This, this is a rom-com, it's a good one. Um, People love this, people love this. Uh, you have Fr Freddie Prince Jr. Uh, dating Matt Damon in it. So uh, people absolutely love this one. Uh, what will happen is we get kind of a, a, a sneaky figure that comes in at first. Is she, the, is she the, the father? Is she the mother? No one knows because she wants to be Two-Face. Uh, and what happens is she takes off that monocle and she's beautiful, you know, just like in all rom-coms. Uh, and then what happens, of course, is someone eventually get kicked in the boob. Um, and that's really kind of the sad part. You know how in all rom-coms there's a sad part to the movie? This is that part where one of the boobs is deflated through this kick. And, um, you know, you have, to, you have to understand that people are fighting for their rights. Um, so then we, instead of like just taking off the glasses to make her beautiful, we have to go through plastic surgery uh, for this one. Uh, so this person goes through a really tough plastic surgery and we watch it, it's very gory. Um, but eventually uh, the people fall in love and uh, it's, it's beautiful. Now, let's go to Dirty Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> This is, uh, this is a horror film. Watch out, watch out. Clint Eastwood does star in it. That is Clint Eastwood. And uh, he's a bad man in this. He's a bad, bad man. And so what happens is it begins like every horror movie, a white owl comes and kills a person that's falling from a cliff. They were going to live, but then the, the owl swoops in and snaps his neck. And, um, and, and that, was, that was a really scary part for me as a, because as a child I had that, that exact dream where an owl swooped down and killed my father. And so what happens eventually in this horror film is that we find out that the people were actually sleeping on the, the forest floor the entire time and then they wake up just like in Saw 1. Sorry if you didn't see that, spoiler alert. Um, but what happens is these people wake up and you're like, oh shit, they've been alive the whole time. And then eventually Clint Eastwood comes in and says, no, you weren't. Bang, 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 and kills him with a wooden stick. Uh, again, uh, we had Christian producers, so we couldn't say magic. Um, and that's, uh, that's again, uh, that's just kind of the world we live in. Blah, 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 blah. Um, so uh, another movie which is near and dear to my heart is Free Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Um, I thought this was an erotica, but it's not. Uh, it's a uh, it's a children's film, actually. It's uh, just uh, it's Pixar's new take, uh, but they don't do anything in uh, animation. Uh, so what happens is uh, we're going through the chocolate pond lake, and it's hilarious. And then Shamu comes, but he can talk, and he says, "Oh no, I'm in danger." 
scared. And so we go, oh no, you're endangered. Is there anything that we can help you with? And the boat comes and eventually the, the next big thing happens, everyone breaks out into song. And the whale starts singing, and the children start, uh, well, they're an opium at this point. Yeah, so, uh, but it's kind of like Pixar does, only the parents know it. The kids just think they're having a good time until we all find out that Aladdin says, uh, good teenagers take off their clothes. You know, it's kind of that same thing. So eventually, um, at the end of the movie, it's fantastic. The whales don't, aren't endangered anymore. They kick the man to the curb. All the whales are now humans. They have smartphones, and everyone lives happily ever after. It's a really, really, really good film. And now I'd kind of like to talk to you about the last one, um, The Walking Dead Poet Society. Uh, this is a hardcore drama. It will blow your effing mind, all right? I, I love dramas, so this one was uh, near and dear to my heart. The scene, the first scene that happens is Robin Williams. Uh, this is his last film before he passed. Uh, God rest Robin Williams. Um, he, uh, well, essentially what happens is he, he starts with asking, what's in the box? What's in the box? And we're thinking, hey, that's from Seven. You can't steal that. Um, and, and all the kids open up their desks and there are heads of their pets inside the, de the desks. And I'm sorry, that's the movie, all right? I, I'm not making this up. But then what happens is we find out that these kids are actually orphans. And so Robin Williams takes them all on in, in his heart and says, you are loved. I want to be there for you. And the kids start learning education. And so... Um, <laughs> And this is what they learned, that if they're going to fight for their right, they need a party like this. And so uh, they start taking out all of the people that did them wrong, and they say, no, we are kids, we can do this, we can live on, we're happily ever after. And uh, you know what, folks, that's the end of the movie. Thank you so much, we really appreciate it. Andy Allen. Thank, that was awesome, that was really, really, Amazing. And speaking of amazing, we want to give it up to Michelle Terpster because she put the slides together. Michelle. Awesome work. Moving right along, let me tell you about our next uh, performer, Rebecca Malmquist. She grew up in Grand Rapids. She's the youngest daughter in a family of five. She is now happily married with a quintet of her own. And she loves to spend her time laughing, talking with family and friends. She's a teacher. She loves to integrate brain science in classroom practice. Uh, she is a practitioner of advanced yoga called uh, Sudarshan Kriya. And she's very active. She volunteers for Broadway Grand Rapids. She loves to cook. She loves to bake. And by hearing this, you know, a lot of people think that she has this amazingly wonderful life full of sunshine, and some people are even a little bit of jealous, but she, she is quick to mention that her family has, oh, actually has a curse on it. And Rebecca will give you more background on just exactly how this, how this curse works in her family uh, with her program called Unexpected Hanging Paradox. Rebecca Malmquist, please. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to my husband for helping me with all these pictures. They're much better than I could do, and thanks for family and friends. I'm grateful. The Unexpected Hanging Paradox is a riddle, and it is super complicated, but it does capture my attention a lot of the time. And in 20 seconds or less, it's basically there's something really horrible coming. It might even threaten your life. For sure it's coming. It's expected, but it's at some unexpected time in your future. So in other words, it's like, surprise! No surprise, but surprise! So as much as you can prepare for it, you're always kind of in a wonder. This idea of paradox is like one idea and another idea, when put together, look like they're opposing forces. But the truth is, they actually maybe help us understand an idea or a truth even better. For example, every single one of you in here, you are special. You are, you actually are very special. You're one of a kind. There is no one else like you. And at the same time, you are not so special. <laughs> I mean, 
you're just not. I mean, look around. There's people that know what it's like to be you and all that, right? I think about this with genetics a little bit, too. Like, my son, he's right up there. When he's annoyed, he makes this face. It looks like this. Look at me for a minute. He does that movement. I don't know. The last time I saw that movement was on my father when I'd come home as a teenager, and he would be annoyed at the story I would try to give him for being late. And my son has never met my dad as annoyed dad, ever. So I'm fascinated by this. I walk around and I flip through these like family albums that go on in my head. <laughs> and I think, how do we learn that muscle memory? Like between grandfathers and sons who never met each other, and mothers and daughters, and I'm fascinated by that. The truth is, I am my mother. And I am not my mother. <laughs> and that is more true than anything that I can possibly say to you. Wherever I go, I take them with me. And wherever I go, they're coming along. They're in my heart, and they're in my blood. For better and for worse, all these paradoxes are true. My mom and I probably had something in common that we never got to talk about. We probably were both afraid of this unexpected hanging paradox called cancer. Because my mom and her, um, all of her siblings all knew what it was like to lose a dad to cancer. So my grandpa, Chelsea, who I never met, died when my mom was nine. And all of his nine brothers and sisters, cancer. Surprise, like no surprise, but surprise. My sister and all of her siblings, cancer. My family, I have a brother and a sister, and I can tell you with clarity, I am special, because I don't have cancer and I have not been diagnosed with cancer. But they have, and they're alive, but they have. So we know we're the walking dead. We have this thing hanging over our head, right? When my sister was diagnosed with her cancer four years ago, we kind of thought it was seriously funny that they wanted to do a genetic test, because she was the first one to be asked, do you want this? And I don't know if she said yes or not, but she sure enough came back with this pathogenic mutation called BRCA2. And I thought, hmm, maybe instead of waiting for that thing to fall, maybe I can try and like do something about it as much as I can, try to control the uncontrollable. And so I got tested, and sure enough, Surprise, right? No surprise, surprise. But in a way, it's actually a blessing and a curse to be BRCA2 positive for me because I'm serious when I say it wasn't that sad to me. It wasn't a surprise, and I wasn't that scared at that moment. And maybe it's because denial is my friend. I don't know. But I can tell you this. It's also a blessing because if you get this diagnosis, they give you choices that don't really feel like choices, but they do give you choices. And one of them is you can cut everything off and you can cut everything out. And that's what I decided to do. So I had a double mastectomy. I had my ovaries taken out. So I took that 87% chance of getting breast cancer, which is the one that my mom died from, and I turned it into a 3%. And that ovarian cancer, I had a 40% chance of, of getting. I turned that into something like a 1%, which is weird, because I don't have ovaries. So how could you get ovarian cancer, right? <laughs> but you can. I don't get it. I don't need to. <laughs> it's weird. Um, and I still, I screen myself, and I go check for the melanoma, and apparently the lung cancer, and all these other things. And in fact, I thought, I know what I'll do. I didn't have to go through chemo like everyone else I know. I didn't have to actually go through that end of life process like some of the people that I love and know. I will spend a year cutting everything off and cutting everything out, which is extreme. But that is what we have right now. And I did that. And one time, in this whole time, there was a doctor that noticed, because I've been doing this for years, I'm not quite done. So it wasn't as easy as we all thought. So instead of having two or three surgeries to have that done, there was complications and mistakes and uh, infections and lymphedema and all this kind of cool stuff that's not cool at all. Um, we get to meet cool people, but then you're glad to not see them, some of them, when you're done, because you'll never, ever have to deal with that procedure again. But here's the thing. One doctor looked at me and said, you're the reason, because of all these other surgeries I've had and I still get to have in the summer, that you shouldn't maybe do that kind of surgery. 
And at the time, I thought, oh God, like, did I do that to myself? Like, do I get to be responsible? Because she made it feel like a choice, but to me, it wasn't a choice. It's like offering me a stone or a bagel for dinner. And I chose the bagel. I choose to be rooted in the truth of my family history, and I'm not so special there, but I have this special opportunity to like try and deal with that thing that's upstairs. And honestly, I don't know if it's done, but I do know this. My favorite paradox right now is the sacred ordinary. Thank you. Rebecca Monquist. Reading over the bio of the uh, next gentleman that we're bringing out, I realized I haven't done anything in my life. <laughs> Terence Rubin was born in Durban, South Africa, and against all odds as someone of uh, Indian parentage. He was able to finish high school. He attended college at the University of Durban, and he came to the United States in 1993. Both he and his wife, Tina, work at Metro Health uh, in the health sports uh, medicine, on the health sports medicine team. And he uses his specialty training in orthopedics, manual therapy, and sports medicine to manage athletes and their injuries in the Grand Rapids area. He also serves as medical coordinator for several local races, including Fifth Third Riverbank Run, Grand Rapids Triathlon, Michigan Titanium, and the Metro Health Marathon. He also serves as an adjunct professor in the athletic training department at Aquinas. Uh, in 2000, he founded PTS Sports Pro Inc., a one-on-one -on -one personal training service. He serves as its CEO and trainer until, 19, or, until 2015. In 2008, Mr. Rubin also helped co-found My Team Triumph, a local GR nonprofit organization which promotes racing with individuals with disabilities. And this has grown into a national organization with over 30 chapters around the country. And he currently serves as the president and executive director of the West Michigan chapter. He's also a triathlete, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, sprint triathlons, Ironman distance events, runner completing 29 marathons since 2005. Like I said, I have done nothing in my life. So, without further ado, Mr. Terrence Rubens. I think that's with my six minutes and 40 seconds right there, right? Uh, thank you, Pecha Kucha, for having me tonight and uh, allowing me to share my story. Um, and my story has nothing to do with any of those things you just heard, but is the foundation of uh, what got me there. So I decided to start the evening off with a blank canvas because I want to paint you a picture of what life was like growing up in a very special time in history in South Africa and uh, the things that we had to deal with to elevate ourselves beyond the situation. And as we all know, that we have those situations in our lives on a very daily basis, and it's, it's not how we accept it, but how we, what we do to elevate ourselves beyond that. So yes, I am South African. I'm currently American. I have lots of labels. I've checked the black box. I've checked the other box. My wife is Portuguese. I've been told I look Puerto Rican. I don't, I don't know. I'm an immigrant, <laughs> and I'm here to share my story. Um, so, but life is not always uh, black and white, although in South Africa they did try to do that. Um, there's this little thing that they started way back in 1948 called apartheid. If you haven't heard of it, you need to do some reading. <laughs> 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 apartheid pretty much means to, to set apart, right? To separate. And uh, I grew up in a life of what we call racial segregation. Um, it, you know, I, I like to laugh at that now because uh, thinking about it any deeper would probably make me want to cry. Uh, but it was a tough time to grow up as a non-white in a country that looked down on you just because of your skin color. And I learned very quickly that I had to rise above that in order to really achieve something in life. I grew up reading signs like this, this area for whites only. You know, we rode, you know, separate buses. We shopped in different areas. We laid on different beaches. Can you imagine a fence going down the center of a beach just to separate one color from the other? Oh, and by the way, I wasn't even classified as Indian. I was classified as Asian. So for those four racial groups, they were the, the whites, the Asians, the coloreds, which was actually a different racial group in South Africa, and then the Africans or the blacks. 
And so I, as the non-white, learned very quickly from a very young age how to deal with the emotional distress when you get posed with questions like these and you get subject to things that just doesn't rub you the right way. Um, you know, we grew up in an area where Mahatma Gandhi did a lot of his work, uh, which was in Phoenix, so which is right outside of Durban. And you learn very quickly how to use the strength of what he said to get beyond your situation and to make you stronger. I remember growing up hearing stories about how, how tough things were for many people and, and how they just gave up because they let their circumstances define them. And I chose not to do that. I chose to define my circumstances. And that is why I am here today, halfway across the world, uh, being able to talk to you about what that looked like growing up. I uh, spent my revolutionary years in this big campus called the University of Durban Westville. Uh, it was an interesting period back in the mid 80s where um, I think it was the early 80s where apartheid was starting to be challenged. Um, there was a lot of protests going on, some rioting in the streets. It started off with some, some murders or some killings that happened in a little town called Soweto and it spread like wildfire throughout our communities. We took to the streets, we, we protested in different forms, uh, mostly non violent, but it's amazing how the media can portray that uh, when the government is in charge of the media. And uh, you know, we, we, we spent our, our formative college years having images of, uh, images of this where these army tanks will come onto our campuses and all of a sudden out of no, for no reason at all, will start spraying us with purple dye and shooting us with gas canisters and rubber bullets just to kind of rile up the, the students. Can you imagine a set of innocent students just standing on campus waiting for the lectures to begin and then being subject to that? Police would just show up so randomly, yet the media would, would release something the next day. Students at Durban Westville were rioting and the police had to be called in to subdue the riots. Now, how do you handle situations like that when you are constantly being subject to, you know, first misinformation and then the brutality that goes along with it by people that abuse power? And that's kind of what has led up to either really hating your life or trying to find the thing that you get to define within that life. Um, as I grew up through all of this, my dad being a pastor and me being a PK, I learned how to figure out ways in which I could self-define my life. And I defined it according to these four essential characteristics. To live, to love, to trust, and to give. Uh, and and when, you, when you wrap your heart around those concepts, you can figure out where the good is in life. I mean, I grew up in a beautiful city. That's Durban. There, there was no hot where I grew up. Uh, South Africa is at the tip of, South, uh, uh, of Africa, and uh, you know, we had some of the best beaches and beautiful places that you could visit and tour. So enjoy life, live where you are at, instead of desiring what you don't have. That's my beautiful bride. 21 years of marriage this year, she's sitting right there somewhere. And uh, you know, in, in, in finding that partner that you can adhere with, that you can love, and that you want to cherish and spend the rest of your life with, was an important part of, of the healing of what we grew up with. Then comes the trust bit, because if you cannot trust, you're not going to be able to grow. And I learned very quickly to trust God and trust Him with everything that I had in my life. And my mom, as, uh, again, as a, as a child of, of a preacher family, very quickly instilled both the fear of God and the grace of God in our hearts. And so part of what I do with, my, with all the, the strengths that I have is to give. And as you heard from my team, Triumph, that we started out here providing opportunity for people with disability has been a big cornerstone of how I combine my athleticism together with my ability as a physical therapist in sports medicine to create opportunity for someone that, that otherwise wouldn't have that. What I learned very quickly is that we are all human, we're born human, but how do we maintain or hang on to our humanity is defined by the choices that we make and the things that we do. And sometimes it becomes a selfish thought of, hey, what is it in for me? And we let our labels kind of lead that. But at the end of the day, you reach deep inside and you find your humanity and you find how you can then define the world around you and just make our world a better place. So thank you very much. <laughs>
I'll tell you what a husband I am. <laughs> of my own free will, I am reading my wife's bio without ad lib. <laughs> Teresa is the uh, co-founder and managing partner of Michigan-based Fubble Entertainment. And um, she has received an Emmy for her co-written and co-produced web series Backstage Drama. She was executive producer, co-writer, and co-host of the television special Holiday Memories of Grand Rapids, airing the past three Christmases. Uh, in 2014, she was executive producer of an animated pilot with the late, great Joan Rivers. Uh, she co-produced a stage reading of the sitcom I've Got a Life in Kalamazoo with Ed Asner and Marion Ross. Uh, Teresa's also been the co-creative producer for Laugh Fest's signature event, working with such notables as Betty White, Martin Short, Kevin Nealon, and Wayne Brady. And uh, prior to Fubble, uh, she was president of Enthusiastic Productions, where she served as executive producer for the children's television show, Come On Over, receiving a regional Emmy and a national daytime Emmy nomination. And uh, she was, in a former life, the executive director of the Grand Rapids Children's Museum. She's a founding member of Last Minute Improv, and she has done moth storytelling events. Uh, she's been in loads of stage productions here in Grand Rapids, uh, an actor and a director. And she has a solo show that she has performed for Laugh Fest before called Warm Cheese. And it, she performed it in Hollywood, at the Hollywood Fringe Festival. And she sold out shows and got standing ovations. Uh, she, it says here, so I can read it, that she's happily married to me. <laughs> she actually wrote that. Uh, and currently, she divides her time between Los Angeles and Grand Rapids. Fortunately for us, she's in Grand Rapids right now. Teresa Tomey. <laughs> husband. I don't always trust him. I <laughs> didn't know what he would say. And I'm listening to my bio and I'm like, that's Patrick Ziegler's bio too. And Patrick is my business partner and best friend who's also here tonight. So yay to you, Patrick Ziegler. <laughs> from Doug, no, from Chicago, wait, LA, no wait, no Granville. No, I don't know where he's living these days. He travels a lot too. Okay, let me breathe. Okay. Uh, five years after my mother died, I finally decided to go through the loads of boxes from my parents' house that ended up in our basement. After she passed, my dad moved into a retirement community and my out-of-state siblings and I packed everything up. So anything anyone marked keep went to our place. So lucky me, I found they'd kept really important things like the hard plastic Tripoli game board and, yeah, and an array of hard plastic and macrame home decor crafts handmade by step-grandma Lucille. So I was over the moon when I unearthed the scrapbook that my mother had made of a trip she had taken in 1953 with three girlfriends from Grand Rapids, Michigan to Los Angeles, California via Route 66 in a convertible. I didn't even know this book existed. My mother's greatest asset, beyond being an overwhelmingly successful control freak and a fairly seasoned prescription drug addict and, well, uh, a chronically suffering woman, yeah, was uh, being a compulsive secret keeper. I mean, my own sister, when she innocently revealed to my aunt that she was no longer going to church, I thought my mother's head would explode. I mean, it was a secret. I didn't even learn about this trip until I was in my 20s when one of those girlfriends spilled the beans. And now I was holding in my hands uh, postcards, letters she'd written home to her parents that they'd saved for her, and, and brochures of places she visited along the way. And, and in that moment, I vowed that someday I would make the exact same trip and I would write about it and share the details because adventures were not secrets. 
And so five years later, I set out by myself to retrace my mother's uh, Route 66 adventure and to spend about six months in LA. I could do this because I am married to the coolest, lowest maintenance man on the planet. And uh, because I don't have any kids and a job I can do anywhere, but especially in LA, so it all worked. Uh, so I left and I made it to Merrimack Caverns on day two, just like my mom did. I was so thrilled when I got there, it was closed because I'm claustrophobic. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I went to, oh, I spent the night in Elk City, one mile from where my mom stayed, uh, her motel. Hers was gone now, but they built a pizza hut in its place, so that was disappointing. And um, I went to the uh, Rendezvous Cafe. It, it was a Baptist church now, they didn't keep the name. Uh, but uh, they did, uh, she kept a napkin, and I'm wondering if it was a really memorable tuna sandwich that she'd had there. And, um, and I went to, oh, I crossed over the Rainbow Bridge in Kansas, like not the Rainbow Bridge. I'm not a deceased pet or lesbian now, but it was something she had done. So I went to, uh, and um, oh, and despite the fact that I am like a panic attack level afraid of heights, I even went to the Grand Canyon. I mean, she went, so fear be damned, I went to. And every turn in the road, everywhere I went, I wondered if my mom was, had seen the same things that I was seeing. And, and each night, I would get to a motel and I would write all of the day's events, uh, and I'd write it in this very fancy, very ornate notebook that I bought specifically for this trip. I, I wrote from my mother's perspective what I suspected she was thinking some 60 years earlier in the same town on the same night of the same journey. I, I wrote her story because she wouldn't. And then uh, a few months after I got to LA, I went on an already planned trip with the husband. Wait for it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> low maintenance and entertaining. <laughs> and uh, uh, I brought the fancy notebook with me and, and I realized when we got to our first destination that I'd left it on the plane. Yeah, I was sick to my stomach, and I panicked, and I even invoked my dead mother. I was like, Mom, please, you have to help me return this. And 48 hours later, the airlines called, and they had found it. <laughs> yeah, I know. And um, I was so grateful. I picked it up at the end of the trip, and on the plane home, I sat down, and I opened it up, and I couldn't breathe because someone had torn all the pages out. Yeah, not all of them, just the ones I wrote in. And um, I lashed out again, and this time I said, thanks a lot, Mom, you got what you wanted. Because, you know, the reason it took me so long to go through those boxes is because that's how long it took me to decide I no longer wanted to hate my dead mother. Yeah. Okay. Don't let the sash fool you. <laughs> She was a bitter, angry woman, especially near the end. And I didn't much grieve for her when she died. I didn't, I skipped all of those Elizabeth Kubler-Ross phases of death and I went right to meh. So I thought that writing about this trip would heal me, would make me feel something. But just like that, the words were gone. Her story was gone. And quite honestly, knowing what a control freak, secret keeping mother I had, I was convinced she had orchestrated this all from her grave. <laughs> I was heartbroken until I realized one day my journal, this journal was a Tibetan sand mandala where you do all of this creative work and poof, in an instant it is destroyed. And I realized that the healing is in the journey, not the journal. And I'm still on that journey. I mean, it is, it's two years and counting that I've divided my time between LA and Grand Rapids. And I am so grateful she went to California and not Indiana. <laughs> and and I, I'll, I'll tell you this, I was really struggling with how to finish this all up, so I just randomly grabbed this slide that I made of this restaurant that I ate at recently. It's in Los Angeles, it's still there. My mom ate there too. And um, I thought, I don't know what to say about it, so I looked to um, her letters for inspiration. And I grabbed this letter, and the first paragraph of the first letter I grabbed, she'd written, Dear folks, tonight I ate at El Paseo Inn. That's the letter I grabbed, seriously. The next thing she wrote was, um, this is the first, last, and only time your little girl will ever eat Mexican food. It's absolutely tasteless. Because <laughs> that's my mother. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'll tell you, I laughed when I read that line, but it gave me the heebie-jeebies, too. You know, I mean, I'm not a woo-woo person, and my mother was not a woo-woo person, but I'll tell you, I have talked extensively about my mother in very public places, and <laughs> I have said some pretty harsh words about her that, as a Catholic, come with a lot of guilt. <laughs> And I have to tell you, working on this Pecha Kucha, pulling that slide and grabbing that letter, the first paragraph of the first letter that I read, out of all the letters and postcards I could have grabbed, it was that one. I knew that my mom was giving me permission to tell her secrets and to tell our story. Thanks. <laughs> Give it up for Teresa Toby. And that is how married life is for me every day. She's an entertaining young lady. Next up, Charlie Wahlberg. He was on our stage in the early days of uh, Pecha Kucha here in Grand Rapids, and he is still one of uh, Dan Terpstra's favorite present presenters. Uh, and Charlie is a purveyor of attention. He helps growing brands stand out from the clutter. He opened the doors at Curve Detroit Marketing Strategy and Creative Design after being thrown out of several well-respected ad agencies. As a marketing strategist and creative director, he delivered blue sky ideas and bottom line results for blue chip national clients and budding challenger brands. He's the co-founder of Mocha Boca, a new subscription box delivering one of a kind stories and adventures to kids. Along with a handful of cool friends, he produces the TEDx Detroit Conference, which attracts more than 3,000 attendees from around the Great Lakes every year. And when he's not building brands, you'll find Charlie inspiring, educating, and entertaining business audiences with his lively keynote presentations on marketing, innovation, and motivation. Last year, he was named the second best PowerPoint karaoke presenter in the world. And this year, he hopes that uh, he will be able to win something that somebody's actually heard of. Um, he's happily married to his unhappily married wife, Elena, and he is here tonight. Charlie Wilbur. Rather than my presentation, what I'd like to do is take you two days into the future. There goes the baker with his tray, like always. The same, okay, yeah, I'm Noah Watson. But, uh, if we can play Pikachu Go, or Pitch Catch a Go, go. So the real difference between children and adults can be summed up with the simple phrase, do you wanna see a slideshow? If you're a kid, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna go down my butt, and then I'll go down Superman, and then I'll, I'll walk down while someone's climbing up, and then we'll get Matchbox cars, and we'll race them down the thing. Or a slip and slide, what about a slip and slide? Slides are endless sources of enjoyment for kids. And then we turn into adults. You want to see a slideshow? No, God, please. This could have been an email. I could have my life back. You better have coffee. The one thing that slideshows have made us all really good at is stealthily looking at our cell phones. <laughs> so you, you go into a meeting sometimes and you just feel like, what did I do to deserve this? I didn't even get a last meal. Do I, you know, what, what are my last words going to be? Please don't make me sit through another one of these PowerPoint presentations. So what I'd like to do, since I've sat through so many of them, is share a few tips that I've learned <laughs> on how to make PowerPoint better. Now we all say PowerPoint's the reason uh, presentations suck, and that's bullshit, because we've all misused technology. It's not PowerPoint's fault, you suck, okay? PowerPoint <laughs> is just the tool, and so are you if you, do some of these things. So the first rule is to save your bullets. Really, no one wants to see your bullet points. PowerPoint was invented as a way to outline our ideas. And what we do is we end up taking our outline and we put it on screen. And so then we end up with these slides of bullets, which are meant to spur us on to the next point, instead of taking these points and turning them into meaningful slides that people will pay attention to and people will really get excited about. 
you know, and, and you can be doing a great presentation, you just feel like no one's even listening to you, you know, and it's, it's, it's very struggling. The biggest crime when you put on a, a PowerPoint slide is then you read the slides to people. This is not story time. No one wants to be read to, especially not this book, okay? You should know what you're talking about. As a presenter, you are there as the presentation device, okay? So use this, this, uh, this guide. Six words per slide, that's it, six words. If you can't get your idea out in six words, you need to hone it down. Maybe break that idea into two slides. The best way to look at your slides is not that they are there as a speaker note to remind you. They are there to emphasize what you're saying. You take six bullet points and now you turn those into six slides. You can only have one idea per slide. The image should be kind of emphasizing what you have to say. That's what the slide is there for. Now, it, it, it can be very hard to find the photos you want to put your presentation together. People are intimidated by photos, but there are a lot of resources out there. You can always take your own. We all are carrying around this wonderful tool called a cell phone. When you're not checking the time in a meeting, you can use it to take pictures with. Now your slide should emphasize what you're saying. Think of your slide visuals as Flava Flav, okay? No one wants to hear Flava Flav the whole time. They wanna see Chuck D. So you are Chuck D, your visuals are Flavor Flav, okay? Or, or think Michael Scott maybe, if you're too white for that. You know, <laughs> that's what she said. That's what your slide's supposed to say. That's what she said. Now, uh, the other big sin we make as presenters is we say, well, you can't see, but what this slide shows, you just said we can't see, so this slide isn't showing us shit, okay? Quit putting up eye charts. You're like a bad ophthalmologist, all right? Also, there's a little button on PowerPoint that says, would you like to add clip art? Fuck no, okay? Do you want the little stick figure? It's like, or a cat. Put the cat in. Everyone likes cats. Rule the internet. You can solve most of your problems with the cat, okay? Now, you don't even have to pay a lot of money for, for, for slides anymore. You can go to Google, type in free stock photo, make sure your child safe filter is on, uh, and you'll get a list of all kinds of sites where you can download images for free. Another big mistake we make when putting our slides together is you've never met a font you didn't love, okay? Quit being a font whore, all right? <laughs> two, two per presentation. Three if you're feeling randy, if you're polyfontorous, okay? <laughs> but not every, you know, oh gosh, you just see headlines all over. And then they cram everything they know about a topic onto one slide. And so then we're like squinting again, all right? Nothing smaller than a 44 point font, really. I, mean, that's a, I think that's a really good rule of font because you don't want to put a word on a slide if people can't read it. That would be kind of stupid, okay? You don't want to just put funny jokes in the footer where the people in the back of the theater have no reason why the people in the front of the theater are laughing, okay? The other thing is, you are not Pixar. Turn off the animation settings, okay? We don't need to see your bullet flying in. This isn't a Clint Eastwood movie, all right? No animations, none, zero, okay? But on the other hand, you are Pixar. I mean, really, the point of your presentation is to tell a story. And now they say that humans have an eight second attention span, which is one second shorter than a goldfish. It has a nine second attention span. So the whole audience has squirrel's disease, squirrel. So if you don't have good presentations and keep it moving, people are going to Check that when you're sitting in, you're sitting in a presentation, you, you click your phone to see what the time is, and then you wait like 10 minutes, it seems like, and you click it again, it's still the exact same time. But you don't want to confuse people. So often we get on the mic and we use all this jargon to make us sound very intelligent. And I, you know, wow, this guy really must know what he's saying. He's using a lot of big words. That's bullshit. Your job as a presenter is to make the audience feel smarter. A great presentation is a killer idea, arresting visuals, and passion. You are a passion transference device. If you're not excited about your idea, there's no way anyone else will be. Get out there and fight the PowerPoint.
Charlene Wahlberg. And finally, tonight, Mr. Stu McAllister. What can I say about Stu McAllister that you haven't heard before other than this guy's an idiot? Thank you, everybody. Before we get into it, uh, I did the 20 random slides a couple shows ago, and uh, I think Dan only asked me to be on this show because I said fuck a lot. Uh, so be prepared, everybody. Be prepared. It's gonna get some fucking lovers over there. Fantastic. This is gonna be weird. Let's let's start this nonsense. Okay, everybody. Let's t let's talk about comedy, everybody. A everybody asked me like, Stu, how can I get into comedy? Can I can I do comedy? Can I make a living doing comedy? And the answer is no. You can't. It's it's awful, everybody. But it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it so much. I've been doing it for 18 years. Comedy is a great thing. You don't know who I am. All right. Let's talk about this picture uh, right there, everybody. Uh, you gotta start early drinking, everybody. You gotta start early drinking. That's what comedy does to you, everybody. Uh, you have to have a family that supports you in your alcoholism. My family did. Uh, I also, I don't know if you noticed the diapers. Um, I was 15 years old when I, that picture, I was 15. You need to have role models, everybody. And my role model uh, was Fonzie, right? Because Fonzie was the one, he got all the girls, he had the sweet leather jacket, he was funny. That's who I wanted to be when I was a little kid. He also drove a sweet bike like I did. So you gotta <laughs> get on that motor, everybody looks, and you gotta have friends, everybody, right? My friend, when I was a kid, I had a cat. Uh, <laughs> And I tried out jokes on my cat, and uh, you gotta wear uh, sweet uh, sweatsuits like that. I had matching pants that went with it. I got all the ladies. I learned everything I could from Fonzie. Uh, Fonzie taught me well. Uh, you gotta be into sports. Uh, you gotta be athletic, because it takes a lot to be on stage. Uh, so, you know, I did the most athletic, I played volleyball. That's the most athletic of sports. I don't know if you're aware of that. Chicks dig it too. Chicks dig volleyball. Got volleyball players with sweet, sweet glasses. Uh, okay, uh, this uh, you got. You do have to go and get an education. And I went back. I I, grad, I actually have two college degrees. Uh, I got my master's degree in social work from Grand Valley. That's me uh, graduating from Grand Valley there. Uh, yeah, that's my dad. My dad was disappointed in me. Uh, he wanted me to do comedy. Okay, uh, there's me. Uh, that's uh, Jim Gaffigan. If you can't tell, he's been a lot. He's he's a famous comic. I don't know if any of you do. Hot pockets. He does, He's super. He's super famous. And uh, I followed him for like a year, and I scared the shit out of him. And I would take a picture within a picture. I don't know if you can see that. It's very like Inception-like shit. Okay, you have to be weird. Uh, you got to do weird characters like this. Uh, you got to be a, a nun who drinks. Uh, and everyone thinks that like I was a pregnant nun, and I'm like, that's that's just my wiener. That's my wiener, everybody. I, I, a huge cock. Uh, it's very big. Comedians have huge cocks. Uh, you have to commune it with nature. You, you have to get away from it all. You gotta do like some Thoreau, Walden, on, on Golden Pond type shit. You're, you're out there. Uh, the scary part is I don't know how to swim. I have no idea how to swim. And I got an, infl oh, okay, you need a headshot, everybody. You gotta get a professionally done headshot. I went to Dan Terpstra and he hooked me up with a sweet, sweet headshot. It's pretty, it looks just like, I, got, I had it done out there, out front, everybody. It's a very good, because people need to know who you are. And that, that okay, uh, you can do some different things in comedy, too. For a while, I was on the radio with Todd Chance. Uh, I quit my job, and Todd was like, you want to come work with me on the radio? And I'm like, hell yeah, I do. Uh, day one, I get in there, the general manager is like, who the fuck is this guy? And I wasn't on the radio any longer, everybody. I wasn't on the radio any longer. Okay, you have to be known for something, and uh, for whatever reason, I'm known for telling dick jokes, everybody. Uh, which is weird, because I tell like may maybe three dick jokes, and they're all about how my dick is super huge, everybody. And uh, so you gotta be known for something, and it's me, apparently it's dick jokes. So there we go. So are you guys following this friend? Huge dick. There we go. 
Uh, every once in a while, someone uh, thinks you know what you're talking about and they'll ask you to do an interview with a magazine. And I did one, uh, this was Grand Rapids Magazine. Did anyone read it? That's what I fucking thought. Nobody reads that magazine. Magazines are dead. Never do magazine interviews, never. It's a stupid, stupid medium that's dead. Uh, okay, you gotta be prepared to do comedy anywhere. Uh, I was in some basement. Uh, I was performing for like four people. I don't, God knows why, dressed up in a suit. It's stupid. Uh, but there I was, I was, I was talking into a mic. I could have just, just went up to sat with them at the table. That's what it was. You, they buy you drinks. This is me a half hour later after the show. <laughs> Completely hammered. I don't, I don't know what, Fonzie was the one who told me to undo my shirt. So I undid, for the chicks, for the chicks dig it, that's right. I, there's no chest hair, ladies, calm down. There's no chest hair. I'm hammered, okay, and you gotta do characters. I mentioned characters. This is my, this is Captain America. I did some Captain America on stage. You gotta try something different. I got my PBR, I got my mask on, and I'm an idiot, and uh, it's pretty much the same thing. I'm just in a costume, and Lord knows why I did that. I did it twice, didn't work, everybody. It didn't work, and it's not working tonight. Oh, you have to have merch, everybody, and I have, I have a shirt, and I sold it to this dog, everybody. I sold the shirt to a dog. I'm pretty good, I'm a good salesman. I should have been a salesman, not a comic. I sold a shirt to a dog. Dogs don't wear shirts. This dog's wearing a shirt that says, don't make me hate fart you. I'm a classy guy. If you want one of these shirts, I'll sell it to you. Okay, that's me at the last uh, Pecha Kucha show, everybody. Dan asked me to come do it, I did it. Uh, I was crossing my arms, I was completely nervous. I said fuck about a million times. Uh, I think I've said it maybe six times right now. I'm not breaking the record, Dan, I apologize. I said I'd try to break it, it's just not happening. So there we go, fantastic. Oh, that's, uh, that's me, that was another picture that I did for Grand Rapids Magazine. Anyone see that picture in Grand Rapids Magazine? Fuck no. You know, they didn't even print it. They took the picture, they didn't even. Thanks for trying, Stu, thanks for trying. God awful, so dumb. That's my new headshot. That's my new one, everybody. So, and that's, uh, you know what? This is what you look like after doing comedy for 14 years, everybody. So comedy's a lot of fun. That was me last year on this stage in front of, uh, God, I can't remember her name, Bridget Everett, everybody, in front of Bridget Everett, who swore way more than I ever could. And that's what you're gonna turn into if you do comedy for 14 years. And I think, that's it, you guys were wonderful. I hope you learned something. I know you did it. Magazines are dead. Have a good night, everyone. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are down to the wire with just a few seconds to go, just long enough to thank Dan and Michelle for organizing this awesome event tonight. We want to thank the crew, the volunteers, Gilda's Club, and the Laugh Fest folks there. Give them a round of applause. They've done awesome. Please leave suggestions for future speakers at the door. Please like our Facebook page, subscribe at pechacucha.org. See us next month at Notos, April 6th, and this will be for the Grand Rapids Film Festival. So the theme will be a little bit different. This is a Laugh Fest kind of theme. It's gonna be, this other one is gonna be a film festival kind of thing. Also, be sure and take a party booth picture, a complimentary party picture, and we'll see you April 6th at Notos. Have a great night, everyone. Good night. Give a hand for Fred Stella. Thank you all for coming. Please, 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 please help buy stuff, do stuff, and go to see the rest of Laugh Fest. This is a community thing that's totally worth supporting. Thanks for being here tonight.